sorry, I was just working out how to unmute myself. <laughs> um, hello, everyone, and welcome today to Explaining Autistic Experience to um, Children. I'm Dr. Melanie Hayward. Um, I'm representing Reframing Autism, and I'm also affiliated with Macquarie University. Um, and I wanted to thank Academy and Dr. Chloe Farahart for inviting me to talk to you today about um, autistic experience um, and how we chat about that with our children. It's a passion project of mine. Um, I am really convinced that the way we set up this conversation, this explaining autistic experience to children from the very first moment, um, is absolutely crucial to the way that they will continue to accept themselves as autistic individuals through their life. So this is a this is a big sort of topic for me where, that I think is really, really important. Um, and hopefully you can see the screen. It says I'm sharing um, and we can get underway today. So I know that most of you are in the UK or I think so. Um, but nevertheless, I want to acknowledge country um, and the country that I am presenting to you um, from. So I acknowledge the country on which we meet today or virtually meet, um, the First Nations people who are the traditional custodians of the land from which I present to you today. And those are the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation um, here in Sydney, Australia. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and I extend that respect to any other Aboriginal people joining us today, um, although I recognise that's probably not very likely if you're a majority UK audience. It is, was, and always will be Aboriginal land. Okay, so before we sort of get underway today, I really just wanted to start with a little bit about who I am and why I'm here talking to you and why this is a passion project and all of those sorts of things so that you have a context for me. Um, I'm an autistic mother to three autistic children. Um, they're aged nine, just, just turned nine to 12. Um, and one of them is on the LGBTQIA plus spectrum um, and more gorgeous little people you couldn't meet. Um, all autistic, um, all multiply neurodivergent, I am an autistic researcher and educator. I've done some wonderful work with um, Liz Pelicano and Robin Stewart and, and Jack Den Houting last year on COVID-19 and the effects of um, the lockdowns, particularly in Australia, on um, autistic individuals and their families and our wellbeing. Um, I'm doing currently doing some fabulous research into um, the experiences of autistic parents and how they partner with their autistic children's schools and what those partnerships look like. Um, but really my deep passion is um, parenting and mental health and the, the nexus between those two things. I'm also find myself to be an educator more than I thought I would be. Um, I'm doing a lot of professional development here in Australia for Australian professionals, um, particularly, obviously, those working with autistic children. So I'm the CEO and founder of Reframing Autism. Reframing Autism is an Australian-based charity, um, and our aim is to provide um, citizenship and empowerment, acceptance, respect for autistic identity, culture, um, and, and a real social um, movement for change in Australia in particular, but globally for more respect and acceptance around um, autistic identity and culture. Um, I'm undertaking a second PhD. That's always exciting through Macquarie University. Liz Pelicano is my supervisor and I'm doing that on um, parent mentalization capacity, particularly non-autistic parents and their capacity to mentalize for their autistic children. Um, that's part of the study and the other part is then developing an autistic-led model of care to support those parents to build their mentalisation capacity. So I'm very, obviously very passionate about autistic-led um, models of care, autistic-led education. Um, and that's what I'm going to say about my PhD in case I get into info dump mode. I'm also the author of Just Right For You, which is a delightful picture book for children 
um, and for adults to, for parents really, to read to their children about their child's autistic identity. Awesome. So that's who I am. So what are we going to do today? When Chloe asked me whether I would talk about um, autistic experience, talking about explaining autistic experience to children, I was reflecting on some of the experiences that I have as an autistic adult talking to parents about talking to their children um, and about and a lot of the conversations I have with professionals are about how you can be a conduit, how you can translate between what autistic people would like to happen and what parents are actually um, have the capacity to do at any particular point, particularly early in their journey. So the first thing that I want to talk to you today about is actually not how we explain or what we say, but why. Why do we explain autistic experience to children? And I'll go into more detail in a minute about some of the reasons that parents say that they don't want to so that we can frame some responses around why you would actually talk to children um, about autistic experience. Then I'll go into a bit more about how we might do that and the different options that we've got as parents, as professionals, as autistic adults to talk to children, explain to children about autistic experience. And the last thing I'll just very briefly touch on is whether we need to differentiate that conversation for the autistic children themselves and for their non-autistic peers, their siblings, their cousins, their family, friends, etc who they might want to know about their autistic identity and how do we do that? How do we affect that conversation too? So the first thing we need to discuss is why explain at all? So as I said, when Chloe asked me about this, I was reflecting about my experiences talking to parents. And in my work with parents, I hear a number of reasons why they're concerned about telling their children about their autistic identity. Or alternatively, um, we'll get a question on our Facebook page saying, you know, I, my child um, was diagnosed at three and he's 15 now and I feel it's time to tell him about his autistic identity. How do I go about doing it? Um, and obviously it's much harder than if you've just done it at three. So here are some of the reasons I hear. My child won't understand that and my child can't process that. Those two um, aspects are really prevalent in parents and professionals as well, I'd have to say, thinking about why you wouldn't disclose an autistic, an autistic identity to children why you wouldn't talk about that is that they just won't understand it's too complex and they're not ready for it yet. Um, they can't process it, so what's the point? They won't get it, that kind of scenario. I don't want my child burdened uh, with the label or I don't want to burden my child with the label of autism. That's another big one. Um, obviously, the stigma and um, discrimination that comes with owning an autistic identity um, comes into play there for parents. An unusual one, usually at uh, when, when a child's at school, I will hear, I don't want my child to associate themselves and their autistic experience with that person's autistic experience, this other autistic child who might be severe or low functioning, um, you know, and I don't want my child to think that they're like, him or her. Um, obviously that one has a lot of unpacking to do uh, and a lot of checking of ableism um, but as I said most of the parents I've worked with are quite early in their journey um, but nevertheless this is one that is a concern for a lot of parents. My child doesn't need to know that's a fairly basic one but one that does come up quite regularly and the conversation is too hard and usually that is the I've known for ages and my child doesn't know, so how do I now have this conversation? Like it's one conversation. So I want to address all of these in turn. So my response to my child won't understand or can't process that is to scrap that. We, we can't think about that. What's more important is that we presume competence, obviously. 
we have no access to what your child, any child, can or can't understand or does or doesn't know. So really um, it doesn't matter if a child has um, a particular ability or capacity to understand at any particular time because understanding evolves over time. What matters is is that we continue to keep that conversation open and continue to be transparent and explicit and obvious in the way we discuss and objective, non-judgmental in the way we discuss any part of a child's identity and that we allow them to grow into that understanding. That way we don't presume that they can't or won't understand we presume that they will grow into an understanding of their autistic identity. It's rather like, um, you know, um, a cultural heritage. You don't expect your child to, there to be one conversation about your child's cultural heritage, which imparts everything that they need to know and that they will understand that and all the implications and, and the future implications um, in, in one moment they grow into that understanding, they grow into their identity. And that's the same for our autistic children too. So I don't want my child burdened with the label. Well, my usual thing um, is, is a twofold response to this. Um, use correctly, labels are simply value neutral descriptors. So labels don't have to be bad, they can just describe. Um, and in some ways, it's much better to have a correct objective label like autistic than for children to start to internalise messages like they're lazy or weird or difficult or challenging or stupid, those kinds of things, um, which are all labels that many autistic children um, attract and, and, and internalise as who they are. I would much prefer a child to internalise that they are autistic, which is a true descriptor of who they are, than to internalise those um, subjective labels that um, are pejorative, are discriminatory, are stigmatising, like, as I said, lazy and weird, um, you know, a loner, those kinds of things, all the words that as autistic adults we've heard as children um, we don't want our children to be associated with those pejorative labels. We want a value neutral descriptor. And it's our ableism that means that autism, the word, or autistic, is not a value neutral descriptor. So I can talk to parents usually at this point about what ableism is and how our internalised ableism, the ableism that we've grown up with all our lives, puts us in a place where we actually feel that what that the word autism is belongs in a um, in, in a place that's not value neutral that it's pejorative or stigmatizing so the burden is the ableism the burden is the social is, is that social dis, the social model of disability it's the disabling society not the word autistic itself so that's that's a way I usually try and deal with that part I don't want my child to associate themselves with that severely autistic person as I said this one usually takes me quite some time um, but um, I always start with that this is the amazing opportunity to talk about every person having different support needs every person having different gifts um, and neurodiversity and I'll when we come back in a minute to the how we talk to children about explaining about their autistic experience um, these kinds of these conversations are going to be really important you're going to need to have them anyway so what a brilliant opportunity to be able to have a conversation to see those inherent similarities um, between you and another person, but also the differences that we're not all alike and not all autistic people are alike, just like not all non-autistic people are alike either. Um, sorry, and probably also check your ableism, but I didn't write that down. Um, I thought that might be a little bit too um, confronting. <laughs> um, my child doesn't need to know. I'm going to explain to it and to uh, <laughs> you and 
in great detail in a minute why, but yes, they do. They do need to know, absolutely. And here's why, and we can go on to the reasons for that in a minute. Um, the conversation is too hard. Well, that's okay, because it's not one conversation. It's a lifetime of conversations. It's a lifetime of demonstrating acceptance. So those are kinds of the things that I would respond to if somebody says to you, no, I'm not telling my child because, um, you know, these are the sorts of ways that we can respond. As I said, one of the big things that we need to acknowledge <laughs> is that my child does need to know. And there are a number of reasons why your child does need to know. Your child needs to know because it's their identity, first and foremost. So I know identity is a really charged concept. Um, and I'm assuming that most of you will have some kind of background and understand identity. It's not an individual dynamic. It's not solely personal. It's not static. It's not singular. It's sort of a multifaceted, as I said, charged concept. And we know that identity is social. Um, and I mean, you think just in the last couple of years about the concentration on identity politics, um, and we can see how social identity has really become. We know that we form our identity through many different ways. Um, a lot of it is around belonging. Identity and belonging go hand in hand. So it might be belonging to a national group or a cultural group or a religious or an ethnic or a gender group or sexual group, sexuality group or subgroups within those. These are how we form our identity as a sort of as a concept, as a cultural concept. Um, but, you know, we know that identity is shaped equally by our health experiences, um, our experiences of social disadvantage, our, so our experiences of social privilege, so that we've got to understand all the different ways that we are growing identity all the time um, and how much of a, um, an evolutionary con um, charged concept our identity is. As much as identity can be used to divide people, and it really is, I mean, America has been a good um, example of that under Trump, it can also be used, of course, to unite people. And we are discovering more and more. I mean, it used to be that we used to think about um, identity and group identity, collective identities, um, it, as a way to explain, for example, um, how Germany, Germans in Nazi Germany could do what they did to other groups of people. So it used to be a way to explain how atrocities could happen. Now we have a counterpoint to that and really it can, we, we're sort of looking at identity as a way to unite people, um, to build mental health, to build social self-esteem, and to build collective responsibility. And this is kind of the power of a social identity. And I'm going to talk more about social identity theory in a moment. So, but the big thing that we know is that realising or actually experiencing the consequences of identity, of how we identify or see ourselves, depends in part, or in a large part, on whether we are categorised into an identity group, so if somebody else puts us into a group, or if we identify organically with that group. So are we lumped in with a group or do we organically identify? So categorisation versus identification. And that's really huge in terms of how we experience our identity. And once we're in that group, how we compare ourselves with other groups outside of that group um, and how we identify ourselves um, is really important too. So basically, do we engage in intergroup discrimination? Do we experience intergroup discrimination? So identity, this concept, is about are we lumped in with people because and external sources said that that's where we belong, do we organically identify? And once we're there, how do we see ourselves and how do we see each other and how do those others see us? 
and how do we feel about that? So this is kind of the theory that goes around, very briefly, that goes around the um, identity. So of course, autism is an identity. It's a hardwired organic identity. Um, so it's not context dependent. You can't not be autistic. Um, it is an important way that we define ourselves, but we have to also acknowledge that, of course, it doesn't confine us. It's not the only thing that defines us. And all of us are more than the sum of, well, we are the sum of our identities and autism is never going to be the only identity. But what we do know is that acknowledging autism as an organic identity is essential for our self-knowledge and that self-knowledge is in turn fundamental for well-being, resilience and self-determination. And because autism is also a social identity, so that's as a personal identity, it's fundamental for those well-being, self-determination, resilience kind of things. But as a, um, as a social identity, autism also exists within sort of autistic community, autistic culture, that's how, that's, there is a social identity that goes with autism as well. And how we, as autistic individuals, interpret that social identity is context dependent. So that, that we are autistic is organic, it's hardwired. How we identify with the autistic community and the social identity is context dependent. How we experience our connection with what is basically a neuro minority within a much broader neurodiverse community. That's not automatic. That's not hardwired. We have to experience that. So as parents, as professionals, as academics, as researchers, we need to control the narrative so that we can help children identify with that social identity of autism that identity, autistic community, autistic culture in a way that doesn't other them through comparison with another group. So what we're looking for ideally is to see that children self-identify as autistic in a personal, organic, hardwired way and therefore feel that they can identify within the autistic community, not that they're categorised by others into a particular form, and that they have enough collective self-esteem within the autistic community to feel individual self-esteem when they look at themselves, but also to, um, to be accepting of differences outside of that social group. So that's kind of a very long way of saying it's their identity. And partly that's why they need to know, because we want to control that narrative. We want to make sure that we're setting them up for that success. So your child or any child does need to know because it's their identity and because it acknowledges their self-awareness and it gives them language to describe their self-awareness. Look, um, if a child doesn't know it already, um, most children will understand at some point that they are different than their peers and there's no point in denying them that knowledge. We have to respect it, we have to embrace it, we have to give them the complete access to their identity to describe it because it's theirs. Um, as I said before, children are going to be labelled by very unflattering labels, subjective labels. So if we give them their identity, we give them the language and the capacity to reframe and to empower them um, to be able to describe themselves objectively and with an empowered, self-aware um, kind of way so that they can reject the labels that they don't feel categorised them appropriately. So without self-knowledge, they may well feel that they are lazy, weird loners, um, and that's not going to lead to good mental health. Your child does need to know because it's their identity, it gives them access to self-knowledge and gives them language to describe them, and it will help them to self-advocate. Um, parents often look at me quite weirdly when I talk about self-advocacy very early in their autism journey. 
But self-advocacy is fundamentally grounded in self-knowledge. And it's the ability to understand and communicate one's own needs. We all think about um, the kind of long-term goal of independence for our child, and it's a word that comes up a lot. But what I think is really interesting is that self-advocacy, which is going to lead to said independence, is often not talked about at all. So we need to bring this conversation into parents' purview. Self-advocacy, it leads to empowerment. Empowerment leads to personal autonomy. Personal autonomy leads to, and we're not talking about full independence because clearly everybody needs support um, with things, but the sort of independence that allows a person to live a fulfilled and happy life. So basically, for our children, an ability to self-advocate really as a child just means that they're confident enough to know their own needs and communicate those needs to the families and communities in which they're operating. If they don't know their own needs, they cannot communicate those needs. So your child needs to know their artistic identity so that they know their needs. Um, so they have to be self-aware. You have to communicate as a parent or as a, re as, a, as a professional, you have to communicate accurate quality information about a child's diagnosis to the child because your child, any child, can't self-advocate if they don't know or understand their own needs. And that's how we're going to build up, as I said, that personal knowledge, autonomy, that independence. So my, my tip to parents is usually, and for professionals, is usually to use factual terminology and labels about what things mean for that particular child. So your job in whatever um, place you're working with children is to provide a child with a thorough and careful understanding of their diagnosis and their needs. So we use objective language, we don't use subjective. We use, um, you, you know, a child needs to be able to describe their needs objectively. So giving them the right language is crucial to self-advocacy. Um, you know, it means looking at needs and accommodations and what talking about what accommodations a child has. What are you doing to advocate for your child on your child's behalf to get them the accommodations that they need to thrive and flourish. You know, if they don't know that accommodations are put in place for them, how will they ever learn to ask for them themselves? Or if they don't know that accommodations are being put in place, then how will they know to say that that accommodation didn't work? Um, it wasn't purpose, it wasn't fit for purpose. Um, so, you know, it's all of those things. And I also encourage everybody to talk about um, disability and the law with children because once um, parents and children are conversant with whatever your disability discrimination laws are they have um, their power because knowing their rights is really powerful it gives your child the confidence in an expectation to be advocate to be able to advocate and to be heard and so it's those kinds of things that identity gives you because without it you can't have any of those things and finally your child needs to know for all of the reasons that we've talked about but also because it gives them a welcoming community and we know as autistic adults that the non-autistic community is not always kind and welcoming to autistic people. So, I mean, the fact that we can talk about the autistic community being the gift of welcome and belonging is so huge um, and so important to mental health. We, research is beginning to show that even if there isn't sort of one autistic experience. You know, the diversity of the autistic community is huge, clearly. So there is a, there's not one autistic experience. But individual people, autistic people, can make meaning of their autistic identity through belonging to the autistic community. For a very long time, it's been assumed that if there was a discrepancy between, say, an individual's 
personal identity and their social identity. So where that individual either identified or was categorised into a socially stigmatised group, that that person's, that individual's self-view would be undermined. So um, I can't remember the um, researcher, but in the 1960s, there was someone who talked about that as spoiled identity because who you were spoiled your social identity. Um, in the early 2000s, it kind of, we explored the idea that if we reframe normalcy, that there's no normal, that everyone's different, um, maybe then um, disabled society or disabled, sorry, social identity and pride could, you know, spark. Not because you belonged to the disability community, not as within identifying with a group that had collective self-esteem, but, um, you know, because if we don't define normal as right, then hopefully people won't mind being um, disabled. And there's a, you know, I think the, the whole, you know, I don't know if it's the same in UK, but in Australia, we still have the kind of euphemisms around talking about disability and autism like they're dirty words. So you, you might have something that's disability or um, those kinds of things. Those, or even special needs is a good example. Those kinds of examples of euphemism come from this idea that if we re-look at normalcy, um, we can build social identity. But really, I think where we are now is to understand that there is pride in autism. There is pride in disability. So there's pride in our autistic identity. And we, that's what we want to gift um, our children. And that's how we do, and we do that through the autistic community. So it's not just that it doesn't matter that we're autistic, but that we can be proud because we are. Um, so, you know, I've, I've got a few studies here that are really important. I mean, in 2013, there was a study by um, Cloud, Lewis and Robinson, and they concluded that young people, they say, need to have exposure to positive role models to promote a positive view of autistic identity so that identification with this group can be self-affirming rather than damaging. In a culture where collective action is an important force for change and improvement, this becomes a political point. How can a group that is often disadvantaged and excluded by society advocate for change if they have no incentive to identify as a group? And we know that that's changing, that we are starting to identify as a group, but part of how we do that is making sure that we bring our children and welcome our children into that group as well. Um, in 2019, Lily Creswell and um, E.R. Lee Cage examined the relationships between autistic identi um, identity and acculturation, so um, autistic culture, um, and mental health in autistic adolescents. And actually, they didn't find any evidence, which was really interesting, to support a link between when you embrace your personal identity and your mental health. But they still concluded that it would be crucial for autistic youth to be exposed to both autistic and non-autistic culture and identity. And that that's quite, quite rare currently, that we don't expose autistic youth to autistic culture and identity, particularly not younger teens and children. Um, and, you know, Kate Cooper um, and her colleagues have done a few fabulous studies um, and the one in 2017 suggests that, you know, autistic social identity um, does offer a protective mechanism for mental health. So, you know, rather than masking to fit it in and be welcomed by non-autistic culture, when you have autistic social identity, there is an authenticity that comes with that and authenticity is very important for mental health. So we, we don't have any of those masking issues. Um, and in their study, autistic, in that 2017 study, autistic social identification was positively associated with um, personal self-esteem, which was mediated by a collective self-esteem from the autistic um, community, you know, perceived of as sort of this positivity around autistic identity. Um, and there were lots of 
negative indirect effects. So, um, so negative as in the higher your autism identification, the lower your anxiety. Um, the higher your autism identification, the lower your depression. Um, and that was through both collective and personal self-esteem. So this gift of community, of social identity is so important. So social identity, a social identity approach, which is basically what we're talking about here, is the reason why, why we have, we don't really have a choice. We have to gift our children um, their identity. Um, you know, we can, we're going to see um, increased collective and social self-esteem. We're going to have a protective factor against mental illness. We're going to lower depression and anxiety rates. And we're going to increase subjective happiness, sorry, subjective well-being, that's happiness, and increase resilience and self-determination. Um, so basically, this kind of social identity approach, this, this idea of, of finding yourself, finding your personal self-esteem within a collective, um, is really beneficial for particularly for marginalized communities to find, um, as I said, that social identity and that collective self-esteem breeds, feeds um, a self-esteem. Self so basically the big message here, and it seems to have been a very long time for me to come to the message, is that acknowledging that your child is autistic will definitely improve their mental health and quality of life. And generally, I haven't actually met a parent who didn't want that for their child, who didn't want to have improved mental health and quality of life for their child. Okay, so how do I explain the autistic experience to my child? There's a big caveat here. And the caveat is it depends a bit on the child, um, but, I'm going to go through a number of options. The first option is using the difference approach. And this is approach, an approach where we start by seeing the diversity in the world. Um, and Erin Human's beautiful um, infographic, um, which you know is the diversity is beautiful, which you can Google if you've not seen it, is wonderful for this. You know, you can look around and start by noticing the ways that every person is different. And we begin by normalising difference. Difference is not something that is, um, that is weird. Difference is normal. And there's a really important point about that because, you know, um, if we accept that people look different, that people have different interests, that people have different strengths and weaknesses, that people have different things that they need support with, that people have different things that they are really good at and things that they, um, you know, can't be independent in. This gives us the language with which to describe autistic experience to children. So it's really important to, that children understand that humanity is rich with difference. And in fact, the world, what makes the world such an amazing place, particularly as an autistic person with you know, great sensitivity and um, details processing, is that you know, there is so much difference in the world. And you can start um, by looking at very obvious differences um, and then move to much, much more subtle differences. And those differences, as I said, might be in, you know, you look at whose favourite, who eats what at home, you know, what are your favourite foods? Everybody has different, um, different likes and dislikes. And that's a good thing because otherwise life would be very boring and we wouldn't have any people to do particular jobs that we don't want to do. Or, or, so the, this the difference approach to talking about if autistic experiences two benefits. One is your child's difference, and they will know that they're different. So your child's difference or the child's difference um, no longer feels different. Um, 
it's not unusual for a person to be different. In fact, there's pride in that difference because you have something new and different and to offer the world. So that's that's part of it. And it also goes back to the I don't want my child to um, associate with that severely, you know, think that they're like that person. Because we can also talk about differences within the autistic community when that time comes. If children understand that what unites us all is the fact that we are all different, that's a really powerful starting point. And I often recommend just talking about differences as the first step in talking to children about um, autistic experience because it doesn't require the word autism. And so for parents who are early on their journey, that's important. It doesn't require um, any special equipment or anything other than observation and conversation around the fact that everybody has differences. And that's a really good place to start. When you've kind of got that, however, where do you go next? Well, sometimes actually children are already predisposed to feeling that different is wrong. So that first step is for those kids or that first option is for those kids who don't, who, who aren't predisposed to thinking that different is wrong. So for my three children, they never thought that different was wrong. They always embraced differences. And so I've never taken this similarity approach with them. The similarity approach is really um, useful for those children who don't want to be different, who maybe um, who would just really want to be the same. And so this is the way that we talk about, we do exactly the same as the differences approaches, except with similar similarities, strange about that. Um, so the reason that we do this is that we can talk about the biological connectors. We are all, we all have a mammalian part of our brain. It is mammalian. It has, an, um, it has a connection uh, drive. All of us have two eyes, one nose and one mouth, or the majority of us do. That's, that's probably actually not true. Um, it's a bit like um, we have in Australia a book called Ten Little Fingers and Ten Little Toes, and it was a real eye-opener to my internalised ableism when someone pointed out that she didn't have a thumb, so therefore she was not like all babies with ten little fingers and ten little toes. And I realised that there were some assumptions, some huge assumptions on my part that went into um, appreciating that book. That's another story. Um, how did... When we talk about similarities, we are talking about innate similarities between humanity, the things that define us as who we are. And for some children, it's important to concentrate on those similarities. So the differences, um, not that you deny the differences, but the differences are lesser, not in a, not in a, um, that's not the right word either. Um, the differences are, um, are less important perhaps than the fact that we are all united by our similarities. So just like we are all united, we are all similar because we're all different, um, there are other things that we, are, we can talk about being, you know, a fairly universal experience. Um, and that sometimes helps to position children within um, a, a social identity that they can identify with. They may not be ready to identify with the autistic community and they want to see how they can identify. And so you can, we can give them the language for that. We can give them um, for some children, there is a caveat with this one as well. For some children, this really is triggering because they feel it undermines the authenticity of 
the sort of the specialness or the uniqueness of their experience. And for some children, it's just not appropriate. But it, for some others, it is. Okay. The experiential approach. Well, this is my one of my favourite approaches. Um, often parents, I think, have in their mind or we collectively have in our mind that when we talk to children about autistic experience, we're going to sit down and have a conversation that says, you know, well, um, autism, autism spectrum disorder is a neurodevelopmental um, uh, disability or developmental disorder. And it means that you have difficulty with social communication and that you have rigid, uh, you know, and, and spout essentially the DSM-5. When I talk to autistic people about how they define their autism, it's very experiential. Not surprisingly, because it suffuses everything we do and everything we, every way we process. So it's not particularly surprising that we find um, an experiential definition compelling. But the reason that I put this here is that um, when we talk about autism as a word and just as a segue, my children always knew that they were autistic. It was never a conversation that needed to be had. It was just a word in their vocabulary like any other word in their vocabulary and possibly when they first said it when they were very young, they didn't understand it. But they, as I said, they grew into that understanding. So, um. I would look up some, um, so when I talk about the experiential approach of how you explain autism to your child, um, it's about looking at the core experiences that make autistic processing different and atypical. So you might talk about sensory things. Um, you might talk about um, orthogonality, you might not want to use that word, but that would be, you know, make, making connections and patterns. Um, and it's really lovely when you have an experiential approach. And I still use this because my eldest will come to me and say, um, Mum, do you remember we had that conversation 12 weeks ago on Tuesday about this? I just watched a documentary about this, which has nothing to do with the two, but it's occurred to me that this and this are related in this way. And isn't that exciting? Because now I can see a whole new way of relating two things I'm really passionate about that I never knew connected. Um, and I can say to my 12 year old that this is an example of their brain making connections and patterns in a very autistic way and, and seeing, pulling out one detail and juxtaposing it to another to make a new understanding that other people have not seen and how exciting that is. When I line up berries with my youngest little person and we classify them by colour and ripeness and size um, and we prioritise how we're going to line those up. I can talk about that being an, ex an autistic experience. So that each and every time your child is acting, is, is experiencing the world autistically, you can show that them that this is their autistic brain um, working. And the joy of that is that often the times that I can that I pull out and say, you know what, that's your autistic brain that's making that, that, that's giving you the power to do that. It's your autistic brain that's allowing us to be able to see the differences and the connections and the patterns. Um, that's your autistic brain that's allowing your senses to be able to discriminate between the details in that pattern that other people can't say, see. Um, or smell that smell or hear that noise. Um, 
it's also sometimes that's your autistic brain that make, that's making that transition really challenging for you. Um, I think there's autistic inertia involved here or whatever. But being able to put a name on um, the experiences that a child has allows them to see that like any brain process, there are moments of strength and gifts and joy and moments of challenge. And so um, we really build up that experiential definition for our children through reflecting on the experiences that they have that are uniquely autistic. And actually, you don't need to use the word autism if it's, you know, if you've got a parent you're working with that it's offensive and they don't want to use the word autistic, you don't have to use the word autistic. Um, you can quite easily just um, talk about the child's unique brain. Um, that's your unique brain working in a way. So there's that approach. There's the, right, there's the brain approach. Um, the brain approach is one that I think is really important because, again, it explains things in a way that children may not otherwise understand. Um, it brings together everything. It brings together the differences, the similarities, the experiences of an autistic person. So my favourite way of explaining the brain to children is Dan Siegel's hand model of the brain, which basically says that here's our brain stem, and I'm not sure, I know I've still got the share screen on, um, but hopefully you'll be able to see enough of my hand that you can, I'm just going to move it slightly this way because it's... Um, very white. Um, this is our brain stem um, and um, the kind of the lower part of the brain with all the um, unconscious parts of our brain, the old reptilian brain, the parts that control our physiological kind of responses, our breathing, our um, sleeping and all those sorts of things. Our thumb here we close that over the top. That's the limbic part of our brain. And the limbic brain is the mammalian brain. It's where it's our centre for emotions. But, um, um, it's where our amygdala is, where you know our, our um, threat response is, and all of our emotions are held in here. And then we have the cortical part of our brain, the cortex, which folds over the top. And the cortex is the prefrontal cortex and these front bits here. This is our highest order thinking. Oh, I'm trying to try and get my hand in the frame there. Um, but also, obviously, all of our sensory processing is here. And our frontal cortex sends messages to our limbic, and you can see how those two are connected, and then through to our old brain down into our body. Right? So this is fairly simple way of explaining the brain and if you look at if you look up Dan Siegel on YouTube um, and hand model the brain he does it a lot better than I do <laughs> um, but essentially there are two things that autistic children need to know the first is that um, our limbic system parts of our limbic system are quite a lot larger than um, children who are not autistic. That means that we are doing a lot of emotion processing and that we are trying to filter through lots and lots of very big emotions. So that's a really nice way of explaining when there are big emotions and emotional regulation difficulties with you know, um, executive functioning difficulties, our limbic system or parts of it are quite enlarged. We've got lots going on in our limbic system. The other thing is, is that now Dan Siegel talks about flipping your lid and then your prefrontal, whoop, your prefrontal, uh, here we go, maybe I'll go this way, prefrontal cortex not being connected to your limbic system, et cetera, et cetera. But for me, the most important thing is that our brains, autistic brains, are like festive Christmas trees. Lots and lots and lots of lights. So if you imagine that you see something and that in a typically developing child's brain, 
they will see something. It'll go in through their eyes and to the back of their head, which is hilarious because that's where the um, part, the lobe of the brain that interprets sight and what we see, seeing stimuli. And that, that sends down to our, into our limbic system and down into the rest of our brain um, messages about what we've seen and what we understand that to mean, whether it's a threat or whether it's something to be interested in or whatever. Now, in, a, in an autistic person's brain, so if you imagine that there's a string of lights in a typically developing person's brain, from the eyes back to the occipital lobe, into the systems that it's talking to and out. Now, imagine that Santa's elves have got really, really, really excited before Christmas and covered the whole Christmas tree brain with so many lights that you can't see the brain for all the lights. The brain, the Christmas tree, is completely covered. When autistic people see something through their eyes, it's not just one lobe that lights up, it's our whole brain. And the messages that are coming into our slightly large limbic system are, light, are, are lighting up all over the place. We have these very festive, lighty, lighty up kinds of, um, of, of brains which means that sometimes it takes us a lot longer to process what on earth is what we're seeing. Sometimes it means that we get to make those connections. As I said, the orthogonality, we get to make the connections that other people wouldn't see because we've got connections between lights that other people don't. And sometimes it just means that we're really overwhelmed because all the lights are going off and we can't quite work out what's important so sometimes it's really hard to discriminate which is the most important thing because all the lights are going off sometimes it's really hard just our brains are really really busy so we're really tired so that brain approach I find is really helpful for children because we can actually bring together the differences the similarities everyone has the basic same brain structure um, but there are differences that account for the way that autistic people experience the world and of course, the best way to do it is to have all of those options over time. What are the what are the similarities? What do we all share that unite us? What are the differences? And again, it's those differences that unite us as well. How, what's the experiences that we're all having um, as autistic people? What are those experiences that we can put down to our autistic brains? And how do our autistic brains work? Very quickly, because I promised Chloe I would stop at 55 minutes and I see I'm already well past that. So that's excellent. I'm really good at sticking to time. Um, I often have the question, what if I've told my child and they don't want to accept? The biggest thing that I can tell parents is that we always can have a moment of mea culpa. We didn't do it right. We need a do-over. Um, you know, um, Maya Angelou's No Better Do Better is really important. So sometimes it's okay to apologise and say, I didn't know enough about autism to be able to explain to you appropriately about autistic experiences. I'd like to start again now that I know better. Um, we all know better, do better over time. Um, and that's not a bad lesson for our children to learn. Um, and to trust that actually um, we have the relationship to be honest and um, objective and to be able to talk to them in a way that is respectful of their autistic experiences. So there are, there are times where we've just not done it in an ideal way. And, you know, I, I said, I, I feel like um, that's okay to admit that we want, that we need to start again. And the final thing I really wanted to talk about was what about everybody else? Well, there isn't. It's a nice, easy one. There isn't really a differentiation because every child deserves to have an understanding about their own brain. Every child could do with that brain, um, not necessarily the festive Christmas tree part, but every child could understand how their brain works. Every child has the right to understand their strengths and challenges in the way that they uniquely experience the world. Um, every child has a right to know that each human has differences and similarities that unite us into the rich tapestry of, the, of humanity. Using the same language 
establishes synchronicity and it also helps children to feel connected. And again, we go back to social identity, we need our kids to feel connected. Take the opportunities to talk to other children, siblings, friends, cousins, as often as you can. The same thing applies if there is an opportunity to talk about an autistic child's experiences and experiential definition of autism. Um, absolutely do that. Do that with other children. So all of those kinds of principles of talking about autistic children's experiences hold true. Um, you need to be explicit and objective, but also you do need to have your child's permission. And if you're going to be talking to their friends about um, their peers, their siblings, their cousins, they need to know that you're doing that. They need to be able to feel that they have the right to um, hold on to or gift people their identity. It's their identity. It's their right. Other considerations, um, social motivation. Uh, you know, we may find that... Um, our children are not motivated by non-autistic friends or are really motivated by non-autistic friends, um, that they um, have um, a lot more generosity in the way that they define friendship or understand friendship. And I think I've got that somewhere as well. Um, bidirectionality is really important that we're experiencing, um, that we're making sure that children understand that as different as they are to a non-autistic person, a non-autistic person is different to them. And so this is, again, back to social identity, that they feel that they have a collective that they can, that they can lean on. Um, so if you're thinking about social skills, that they are bidirectional social skills. And this goes to particularly when you're talking to those cousins and siblings and friends. Um, it's not about your little autistic person always learning non-autistic social skills but the bi-directionality of that and that that little person um, should also be able to teach autistic social skills to their non-autistic peers. Um, you know as I said we redefine friendships usually in terms of the way we connect with people about an interest and so friendships um, age peers is doesn't seem to be a particularly big concern of ours we would much prefer to have a friend who has a similar interest than a friend who um, is the same age as us. And that goes back to the social motivation thing, is that sometimes when we're talking to other children about um, autism and autistic experience, you know, our, our child that may not, it may be our idea of our child's friendship from, you know, our own experiences, but it might not be our child's um, understanding of the friendship. Um, the best results often come from structured socialising. So, you know, playing a board game, something with, with rules rather than just allowing kids to go at it and hope for the best. Um, and so it's in those kinds of moments where you will have opportunities to talk because, you know, that's okay. Um, gaming is a really good one, particularly Minecraft and those kinds of things where you can actually connect um, and you can talk about autistic experiential strengths alongside, you know, um, uh, alongside what might be perceived by a non-autistic child as challenges. So I hope that's given you some insight today. I feel like I've talked for a long time and maybe not given you very much information, but hopefully that's not the case. Um, and um, enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you so much for listening.